put 100 milliamps in there and it not come out, <laughs> right? You know, it would defeat your current source if you tried, but it's not possible. You know, if you have two electrodes, it'd be 100 milliamps in there and 100 milliamps out there. The integral of the current density has to be zero. Um, so, you know, so, so actually in practice we're only allowed to apply a G whose integral is zero. We can apply any F and that corresponds to changing it. So, um, actually, you can specify any F, you can specify any G whose integral is zero, and if you just specify the current, it's not quite unique. It's very nearly has a unique solution, but it's just that if you added any constant to U, it goes away when you take the derivative, and so U plus constant doesn't appear in the equations at all. So it's clear that we can add any constant to it, and that corresponds to simply not knowing what, what counts as Earth. There's zero potentials not defined. So you, you just arbitrarily choose that constant. You could say choose some point to be zero. Choose one of the electrodes to count as zero. But it's, it's only relative. So um, Dirichlet band recognition is unique. Neumann band recognition is unique up to a constant. Well-known results in PDE theory. You can look them up on exactly what the circumstances are. Um, and then there's a unique solution. Of, of those conditions for uniqueness of solution, um, there's one thing that springs to mind as being particularly important. And so I should just mention at this point um, power dissipation. So let, let me just remind you of probably at school you did Ohm's law. I'm going to write it on the side because it's, it's very much on the side. So you probably remember V equals IR, right? Now, for me, my conductivity, I, I like to think of con conductance instead of resistance, which is 1 over R. Um, uh, so, so what am I going to do? Um, so instead of V equals IR, I want 1 over R, V equals I. Right? So that's my Ohm's law. Sigma E J. And you, you probably also remember that power is equal to current times voltage. Yeah? Or there's another formula from Ohm's law, Ohm's law, V squared over R. So if it's so that's why it's Ohm's law, you can get the power from either I and V or V and R. So I'd just like you to bear that in mind because, you know, th this is what you did at school with batteries and resistors and so on. And that's how much ohmic heating you get. So it's interesting how much heating we have. Um, in particular, you don't want to cook your patient. Um, probably don't want to cook the ground, but that's more an issue of energy consumption. Um, so, so the power is quite an important quantity. In, in some way, the energy dissipation, the power dissipation, is more fundamental than the E or the J. And so, um, I'm just going to bear that in mind in what I, what I say. That the, so, the uh, power uh, density is... Um, going to be, well, E dot J, or sigma E dot E, right? same thing, so um, that's like I times V, I times V, and that's like 1 over R times V squared, so, so this is omic power, but in a continual sense, this is a density, so it's per metre cubed. It's watts per metre cubed. So this is how much we're going to cook somebody. Um, so if you put too much electrical power through someone and the, the electrical power is too great in too small a volume so that your blood supply can't remove it fast enough, then you would cook. But the body's very good at maintaining a constant temperature. A uh, little tiny change in temperature and you feel quite ill. So um, so, you know, your body can deal with a certain dissipation of power, but um, th this is the thing that you would assess to see if you're simply cooking somebody. 
And it matters in electrosurgery, which is designed to cook people locally, right? So you actually want to cook them where you're trying to seal off the blood vessels as you, cook, as you cut them, but not on their back where you have the earth electrodes. So it's very relevant to uh, medical physics. Okay, so the integral over omega of sigma e dot e is equal to the total power. So this is d, well I suppose d dx, I mean dx1 dx2, let me write it out explicitly, dx1 dx2 dx3. So that's the total power. And that, so this conservation, that power all comes from what you put into the boundary. Um, and the power that you, that you apply is, um, is going to be the voltage at the boundary times the inward current density integrated over the surface gives you the total amount of power that you actually put into the system. So that's V squared over R, that's I times V, but this is the power on the inside, this is the power um, applied to the boundary. So this energy conservation thing, which um, let me perhaps just write it here as well, it's omega sigma grad u dot grad u d, d, dx. Um, so uh, this is a rule that u has to satisfy that the power dissipation has to be um, equal to the power of the boundary. And the, the thing that I was coming to, and, and so you can actually start with energy conservation and derive everything from that. And in some way that's slightly more physical, um, at least partly, because it only has one derivative on the u. Now, whereas the original way I wrote down, I had to take second derivatives of u. And you have to ask yourself, physically, what constraints are there on the electric field and the voltage? Is it allowed to have jumps? Point sources, singularities, so they have to be smooth. These are physical considerations. Um, well, at the very least, the power dissipation, or this locally, has to be finite. Or at least, um, you know, on the scale that our model applies, this integral has to be finite. Right? So it can't have you know, delta functions in it or anything like that. Right? So, so this, these integrals have to be defined over you know, sensible little neighbourhoods, and certainly this thing has to be finite. And so this is a restriction on the voltage that maybe um, grad u has jumps in, possibly, but certainly these integrals have to be finite. And that, that's a physical consideration, um, and it's related to a mathematical constraint that's a very common constraint to this problem when you're thinking of solutions that are much more general than smooth functions you allow jumps in things that if you, if you say that the integral over omega of um, well, I suppose it would usually be So if the integral of u, squ u squared plus the gradient of u squared is finite, we say u is in h1 of omega. That's, um, that h is called a Sobolev space. OK, so. Let me just unpick this. In fact, once you have a solution of an elliptic equation, it doesn't actually matter about that bit. Um, if, if this is finite, that's finite anyway. Okay? So that's just a little, that's a technical thing you read in PDE books, but it's kind of eminently plausible. And so when people say that something's in H1, 
and, and we're talking about solutions for equations, we're really talking about grad u squared being finite when you integrate it. Now, if you choose relatively modest kinds of sigma that are bounded above and below, then this sigma doesn't really make any difference. If it was going to blow up somewhere, so the power went infinite, it would do it whenever you chose, you know, as your bounded sigma. So, um, to, to a very reasonable approximation, saying that u is in h1 omega, which is what you'll find in the books on how to solve PDEs, and indeed, in, when we solve it numerically, this is the type of solution they talk about, it has a very real physical significance as something that's got finite power. Okay. So, somehow the things that mathematicians invent because they're convenient to work with turn out to be exactly what, what's true physically. And so we would allow something, you know, that maybe the gradient has jumps in and so on, but as long as when you integrate the gradient squared, it's finite. Okay, so um, uh, Sobolev spaces are really about saying how many derivatives you have, um, but in a slightly weaker sense, that you only need them to be square integrable. The square is finite when you integrate it. So it's a way of measuring differentiability in a kind of average sense. So this is very important to us, and uh, it's important when we solve it numerically, because um, uh, that's the, these things, these type of solutions, are the ones we can approximate using finite elements. And that's how we usually solve the forward problem. So that's why I'm expressing that notation. Okay, so... Um, well, I'm still on the forward problem, and I said that one thing about EIT compared to, say, other electromagnetic inverse problems that's very nice is that there's some easy cases that you can solve. And to get an intuition about EIT, there's really two things that are good to do. One is to get one of these buckets with salty water in and move something around and see what happens. With a bit of practice, if you look at the data, you can find where, where you put your finger in or whatever. You can do it by eye. It figures that we can do it in our heads to some extent because tiny little fish can do it quite well. So, you know, it can't be that hard just to find something with EIT. It's very hard to get a complicated picture, but the fish are engaged in the problem of locating some food. It's a relatively modest aim. So, so it's good if you get a chance to go into a lab, say the process tomography lab here, where they do these experiments and just see what it looks like. But another way to get intuition is to work out some easy cases that are solved analytically using elementary means. And these also give you a lot of insight. And between the two, you might get to feel that you actually understand what EIT is doing. Um, so, so this case is actually on the nose, and it says a con the, concept the concentric anomaly, a simple example. It's fairly simple. I mean, it could be an undergraduate exercise to work this out. It is actually fairly a long exercise to work it out, but you know if you went part way down it, it you'd sort of maybe take some of the details for granted. But but it's well within everyone's ability to do this. So let me let me just set it up and tell you what.